Yes, that's right. We're back. The Rebel Rebel is back. COVID be damned. Uh, it's 2021. As always, I'm your host, Michael Dean Dargy. In December, we got locked down during COVID and my production schedule suffered. So my apologies to all the listeners and my amazing guests for having to wait a couple weeks for a brand new episode. Please head on over to the Rebel Rebel Podcast.com and consider becoming a paid subscriber to help us shine a light on even more amazing creative rebels and entrepreneurs. Now, because we broke out of the orbit of 2020 and are now sailing into a brand new adventure, my first guest of the new year is a guy that I've known for 20 years. He's one of my favorite Americans of all time. He's the best pirate friend a guy could have. He's a lover of all things old and important. And you want to talk about inspiring? How about working towards a childhood dream that's finally come true after 60 years? He's always been this close to fame and fortune. Please welcome to the show, author Gary McAvoy. Well, I've never been in a better place in my life. Okay, let's talk about this. I'm really in such a great space right now. Oh, it's so good. It's taken, I've, I've, I've wanted to be a writer since I was 10 years old. And uh, I've been writing through business, you know, all the businesses I've had. I've been a serial entrepreneur, if you want to call it that. Yeah. And uh, so I've had writing in my life. And when I was younger, I had a sailing club I started in Southern California on the coast there. And a sailing club? Sailing club, yeah, charter club. Okay. I had it for 10 years. It was a great gig. Um, taught sailing and all that. But uh, during that time, I was uh, writing a month, a weekly sailing column for the local newspaper. Yeah, that was kind of a kick to do. But I never really started writing uh, books, which was my goal, until oh god, uh, two years ago. I started a novel in 1998 uh, that. Uh, had the exact same premise that in two that in five years later, yeah, Dan, Dan Brown, Brown, Dan Brown would come out with the Da Vinci Code, <laughs> and it was the, basically the same plot, different characters, different uh, yeah. structure of it. But uh, I, so I put it on a shelf for fifteen years or so, and uh, got back to it last year about March or so. Finished it in five months. Wow. And that is the Magdalen Deception. Yeah, it is. Which is uh, which is getting great reviews on Amazon. I, uh, I saw that you have a lot of reviews. A lot, yeah. It's only books only been out ninety days. That's so amazing. I've got about 80, 85 something reviews. Well, and what and one thing I love about the book is the. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I take you at the word of historical accuracy because I'm not a historian. But there's, I mean, it's one of those books that has got all of the, uh, the history baked into it, where you're like, oh my God, this could actually be real. People, people who are writing to me say that they actually Google and Wiki everything that, that I'm writing about, uh, and they find it. They find it's actually <laughs> occurred in history, and the yeah. figures I use, the historical figures, are actual people. Yeah. I take things they've done in their life, and I'll tweak it just a bit, fictionally, to make yeah. it unbelievable, uh, and but with that seed of historical uh, context, yeah. and that's what my readers, uh, I think, really love about my books is that they're based on historical events or yeah. people, and uh, the the tale I spin around it is believable and, from their view, pretty exciting. Yeah. So I've accomplished my job. I finally made it as a writer. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I, I, there's so much to unpack in this, Gary. I first want to introduce everybody to you. So Gary McAvoy, um, l- let's just find out a little bit of the Reader's Digest condensed version of Gary McAvoy. Uh, who are you? What are you doing? I know you're a writer. I know you're a serial entrepreneur. I understand that, uh, you know, I've known you for 20 years. Um, and this is, you know, you, you have a, a fictional book out, but you've done nonfiction stuff. Give us the Gary notes. The Gary-ness. Gary-ness factor. Yeah. Um, well, let's see. Uh, I learned early on that I didn't ever want to work for anybody. I, I just, 
did not want that corporate life. And I had touches of it in my early 20s when I worked for a major corporation that tucked me in a cubicle and, and uh, it just was not my way of living. So as I mentioned earlier, I started the sailing club when I was 26. Yeah. And uh, that thrived for 10 years. It's still going. It's still, still thriving today. Uh, and that was in 1976. So uh, from there, I went, I took a few years off, traveled, lived up in Northern California. And uh, uh, actually, I did write uh, a book uh, for an invention that a friend of mine created, uh, uh, an exercise exercise device, but it never went anywhere. We were, we were close. I've been this close, Mike, to to fame and fortune four times in my life. And <laughs> for some reason, reason adjacent. It's, yeah, it's just, yeah, it's just for some reason, it just didn't click right at the time. Huh. Uh, but right now, um, at the ripe age of 71, my, my life is clicking. Yay! <laughs> Yay. So that's, um, let's see, back to the nonfiction book you mentioned. This was, um, and every word is true. Yeah. I got into this in a strange way. I have a, one of my interests, as you, you know, is uh, collecting historical memorabilia. Yeah, uh, and what a historical collection. Historical letters and manuscripts, documents from history, old photographic, uh, historical photographs. And um, I've been doing that, oh gosh. 40 years, maybe, and uh, decided one day to make it a business, an online business. So right. put my whole collection up online, and this gives me the opportunity not, you know, to sell pieces that have appreciated value and to acquire new inventory. And I always go for things that appeal to me personally. Um, Einstein, uh, Oscar Wilde, some of the luminaries in history that have had an influence on me in, in some respect or on the world in general. Yeah. And uh, one day I was approached by this uh, man uh, named Ron Nye. And uh, he said, my father was uh, an, a special agent with the Kansas Bureau of Investigation. And he um, uh, worked on the uh, Herbert Clutter murder, family murder case in Kansas in 1959. Um, and I and he says, uh, does, does my father's materials and books signed by Truman Capote and things like that is that of any interest to you? I said, sure. Maybe he's one of my favorites. And so he sent me this material. And as I'm looking through it, I discovered that he, and he had official uh, investigative reports from the murders from the, and, and the subsequent investigation that went on for months. Uh, a lot of stuff in there that and I had read in Cold Blood by Truman Capote. And it, what I had read in the official report was a very different story than what Capote had written. Right. And it, it, it led me down an avenue that, that uh, uh, intrigued the hell out of me uh, in terms of different people involved than what was originally told. So the more I looked into it, the more I realized there was much more to the story. So I wrote, and every word is true. Yeah. Uh, which comes from a quote that Capote uh, said. He said, I wrote this book about the Clutters and Perry Smith and, and Richard Hickok, the two killers, and, and every word is true. Well, every word wasn't true in this book. As it turns out, he, he uh, I won't say fabricated, but he polished it pretty well. Right. Uh, and, and he left out a great deal. He may, he, he may not have known what I know because he may not have had access to the official reports while he was doing his work in 1960, 59 to 65. Wow. So uh, that book's still selling well. Uh, came out last year and uh, ha has uh, great reviews, uh, especially by people who have read In Cold Blood and really know the material. Yeah. It was so nice to see like a different angle. Yeah. The state of Kansas sued me. Uh, what? The whole state of Kansas, the attorney general sued uh, me and my client, Ron and I, saying, <laughs> saying that this uh, material is not to be made publicly available. 
they took us to court, and after four years, we won. The court said this is publicly uh, 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 of a public. This material is of public interest and can be published. Wow! So uh, it was a long haul. I mean, not one I'd ever want to do again. Jeez! But, but it was. Uh, it certainly brought a lot of attention to the book, <laughs> as as publicity generally tends to do. Well, and, you know, check, you know, being sued by an entire state. Yeah, and winning. <laughs> and winning, yeah. <laughs> it's not just getting sued by an entire state, but it's winning. The first, it's the first time the state of Kansas had uh, uh, lost and been required to pay a fine. <clears throat> ah, wow. Our, our attorney's fees. Oh, that must feel nice. Feels great. Yeah. Oh, and so when did that wrap up? Uh, let's see. Um, um, I'd say 20, they sued us in 2012, 16, 2016. Wow. Up. Yeah. That was, uh, you don't want to, you know, it makes me, it makes me tentative whenever I put anything in, in public, whatever I, it makes me cautious about what I put into emails because through the uh, uh, um, uh, not due diligence, uh, um, due pro- no, there's another legal word. Right. It's not coming to me where they, they have to, they have access to every email, everything that you've ever written regarding this case. And that includes wow. all the email that went back and forth between Ron and I. Not our attorneys, but Ron and I, and anybody else I've ever discussed the book, the book or the materials with. Holy! And you know, so now I'm I, I well, I'm always security conscious as a rule. Anyway, being a technologist, yeah, uh, I I'm really conscious as to what I put into an email now. <laughs> wow! No kidding. Uh, as we all should be. Holy moly! Um, we- so let, let's let's skip back in time a little bit because I'm I, I'm driving towards this thing. So when we first met, it'd be around two thousand ish. Yeah, with uh, Carl so, the boxer. Yeah, Carl the boxer. <laughs> <laughs> that was an amazing time. Uh, yeah. We'll get to that story later, but oh. <laughs> when uh, when we first met, you were helping a company I was with do some technology, specifically SEO stuff. But we talked, we hit it off, and uh, you. Man, what an interesting story! Because you used to, you've been talking about being a writer ever since I've known you. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess what I'm what I'm driving at is, why did it take you so long to write your first novel? Work, yeah. work, keep, but keep keep uh, you know to make a living. Yeah, that's all it was. The, um, I when I head into something like I I dedicated myself to it. Yeah. And I couldn't write part time. I couldn't do it on evenings and weekends. That that doesn't work for me. Now, yeah. I, as it is, I <clears throat> I have several clients and uh, do good work for them. But you know, when I have other time, is when I can write, and that's that's uh, um, that's really good quality time for me. I didn't have that um, in the earlier years because I was excessively bus- busy with too many times working right. hands for too many pies and uh but now it's everything has come together and it's it's just such a great time oh that's awesome so uh, do you plan on uh I, well i guess days of covid maybe this isn't happening but are you looking forward to a book tour no no there, there I, I i used to do book tours i think i've been mentioned yeah. I, I escorted was a media escort uh, for authors who came through Seattle book tour. Yeah. This was, oh, I don't know, late nineties, early two thousands. And, uh, those are pretty much long gone now, but due to COVID, yeah. the two publishers budgets didn't accommodate. It's an expensive thing to process for book tour. Right. And I guess you've got to sell a lot of books on that tour to make it yeah. worthwhile. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, and that's uh, generally, I mean, word of mouth is, crucial for authors to get get their books uh read yeah what, what have you done um because i mean you're a you're a mad genius when it comes to technology and seo stuff have you deployed any of that to you know get your um, oh yeah 
Yeah. yeah you anything anything you that you want to share? You can't not find me. <laughs> <laughs> and the most reclusive guy ever I've ever known. Like you're so That's, hard to find. You just started social media. What like three weeks true. ago? I don't know. I am reclusive. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's SEO. SEO is um, both art and science. You know, there's 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 practical ways of getting um, found on search engines and yeah. other areas. But you know, I've, I've been doing it for 25 years, something like that, since the the year the internet was invented. Yeah, 1996. The way back machine, holy way back machine. Oh my God. So, um, are, are there, are there specific things that you deployed? Uh, cause uh, like literati editions, which is yeah. your publisher. Yes. Um, how does literati get all this stuff out into the world? Books or you mean books? Well, yeah, I guess just, you know, how, how does, how does literati editions, um, you know, bring sort of shed light or shine light on your, on your, on your books? Well, it's uh, Literati Editions is the name I came up with for my publishing company. Yeah. Uh, so it doesn't sound so much an it as a he. <laughs> <laughs> it should be me. <laughs> uh, so uh, it's just a branding thing. You know, yeah. it's, Literati itself doesn't do much except exist as a as a brand. Are are you ever considering bringing other authors on under Literati? No, no I've thought about it. Uh, uh, there are enough small publishers out there, and mm-hmm. I really don't want to. If we get back to that reclusive part, <laughs> I don't, really don't want to be responsible for other yeah. people's lives or livelihoods. Right. Uh, I'm sure I could do a bang up job for them, but it's not what I want to do. Yeah. Well, so let's talk about that. What do you want to do? I'm doing What's it. Next? I'm doing it. I've got uh, book three in the series, The Magdalene Chronicles. I'm working on book three right now. Wow. Uh, it took me, I think, seven months to write book two, which I don't know. It's, it's, it seems to be a record. <laughs> I mean, it's for, it, it seemed like a snap of the fingers to me. Wow. I couldn't believe how fast it went. And when, and, is it, when does it hit the stands? Uh, January. Oh, Thank you, Reliquary. Yeah, it's uh, in fact I sent it, sent the early review copies to my launch team, about thirty people, and the first review came back today. She she said uh, this is the first time when my Apple Watch alerted me that my heart rate was rising too fast. <laughs> <laughs> I said, "What a great review!" Oh my god, <laughs> that's a great review. I'm going to use it. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. So I'll, my editor is going through the manuscript now to polish it and make sure everything's flowing and logical. And, uh, and then I'll go through the process of publishing in the next couple months. Yeah. Amazing. Congratulations. Put in the audio book, which the great Will Dameron is narrating. Oh. Uh, he's, this guy's voice is perfect. He's did book one, which, uh, Audible hasn't released yet. They're still going through their mechanical processes. But uh, he's uh, one of the top 10 voices in the world. Wow. Um, so I, I, have, I have questions about that. Just because recently somebody asked me if I would voice uh, a novel that they had written. Great and audio voice. What's that? You have a great audio voice. Ah, you smooth yeah. talker. True. <laughs> But I'm I'm curious, you know, like, what does that look like? Does is it expensive to do? Like, is it worth Will, doing? Will's rate is 450 per finished hour. Yeah. As a broadcaster yourself, you you may know this, but for your listeners, a per finished hour includes uh, editing, uh, uh, sound modulation, music if it's required, yeah. um, additional voices if they're brought in, uh, and meshing those. Uh, and then producing it for final audio output on Audible and other uh, audio book distributors. Yeah. And, so, and what is that? Uh, so how many pages are we talking? Like, what? Can, oh, can, you, can, you, can you math it for me? Yeah. My, uh, the Magdalene Deception was uh, 
70,000 words and uh, 370 pages. And it took about seven hours for an audiobook. Wow. Roughly. Um, so that's that, actually not as much as I thought it would be. Yeah. At least I think on the, uh, don't work out the math for me because I'm not good with that. Yeah. I thought he did around 2,500 words per hour. Does that figure out right? So wow. Uh, maybe I'm wrong there, but it seems to be that number that's stuck in my head. So. Yeah. Well, amazing. Yeah. Uh, and uh, just because I'm curious, and you can tell me, we can cut this out if you want, but um, your downloads of audiobook, what, what's the, you know, versus buying the actual book? Like, what does that look like? Well, I haven't had that experience yet because Audible hasn't released the first book. Oh, I'm sorry. But I did my own for And Every Word is True, that book. I did my own audio book. I, I produced it myself. Yeah. And uh, that uh, is still selling. I've, in the last year, I think I've sold around 300 copies. Uh, okay. Um, the uh, uh, process for me took about 10 hours for me to do it with my audio setup here. Yeah. So, yeah, was trying to reach me. <laughs> Gary, Gary, uh, Gary. Um, but, uh, where, let's see, where was I? Oh, the uh, Audible, I mean, the, uh, uh, the Magdalene Deception will be out at audio within the next month, I'm hoping. The next few weeks, ideally. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Oh. But there's nothing like, audiobook sales are skyrocketing now. They're, especially with COVID, people are looking for things to do at home and that's sure. reading and listening. Yeah. Audiobooks are skyrocketing in sales and uh, it's nice to get into. That's why I say if you have any interest in it, go to uh, voices.com mm -hmm. uh, and uh, voice123.com. Both of those are the top audiobook uh, production outfits. Interesting. Um, ah, that'd be cool. Extra money stream, passive income. Yeah, right on. That's all about. Oh, it's so good. Uh, so, with your uh, with this series, how many books are in the series? Is it three? Is it? Uh, it will be three. Okay. And uh, two are done. Thirds in progress. And, and what happens after of, that? Well, I want to use the same characters. I kind of kind of tied myself into. Um, this is the, uh, the corporate cat, by the way. Oh, hey, Truman. baby. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> it's like, no uh, way. Uh, I, I named the series The Magdalene Chronicles, and which seemed fitting for books one and two. And now at book three, I'm trying to think of what, you know, there's The Magdalene Deception, The Magdalene Reliquary. There's only so much I can squeeze out of Mary Magdalene. <laughs> uh, so I should have renamed the series uh, the Father Michael Dominic series, or who's my main character, the protagonist. Uh, so I'll probably begin a new series with his name only because uh, Father Dominic is a Vatican uh, archivist in the Vatican Secret Archives. Yeah. And uh, the Secret Archives for 1,500 years have been accumulating every uh, document the church has ever produced uh, or other people related to the church. And it has millions and millions of documents, 53 linear miles of documents uh, stored in boxes on shelves, which have never been, never been seen by anyone living and have never been archived by anyone in history. So we have no idea what's in there. And this is truth. So my, my character can take that and run with it and, and he's already found several really exciting things that <laughs> split two books out of it. <laughs> so, uh, Father mm -hmm. Dominic has a long life. I have a, okay, so that I, I have a question. Have you had any backlash from uh, from Christianity? Not yet. Hopefully, hopefully I will. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you shit disturber. <laughs> uh, I've had several. I myself am, am an atheist, but. Uh, uh, I've had several uh, just true believers write and say um, things like this. I, I felt this was going to offend me, but it didn't. 
he treated the church and, and religion so respectfully. Oh, that's and nice. the characters did, and, yeah. which is kind of my nature. I mean, I, I don't pick bones and pick fights. And yeah. Things like that. I'm, I'm a peaceful guy. Uh, I don't like to rabble rouse. And, um, and I think that's coming through in my work. Oh, that's amazing. So, so uh, yeah, it's good to have the Christians who read the book come away with positive feelings about it. I'm really pleased by that. Oh, that's great. I love the fact that, you know, A, you found your passion and you're, you're writing um, now and you've, you're in your happy place. I also am inspired by the fact that, you know, you are, are a collector of old things. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, that, fa- that helped find that inspiration for this, these stories that you're telling. What is your favorite old thing that you have? What is your favorite collected, uh, I- a collected item that you're most proud of? One, I have two of them right behind me. You see this right here? Yeah. This is uh, a letter that Truman, well, it's not a letter. It's a piece of paper that Truman wrote. That Truman Capote actually typed out the first chapter of In Cold Blood and signed it at the bottom of it. So he looked over my shoulder as I was writing about his book the entire time. This right there is uh, a little note that Walt Whitman hand wrote uh, to a woman who he'd sent his newly published book called Leaves of Grass. Sent his, dear madam, hope you received the books I sent you. Uh, And that's one of my favorites. Wow. Yeah, it's... uh, Gosh, I've got uh, like a museum here, Michael. Yeah, surrounded by yeah. stuff. Yeah. I want to say, and and I this will be this will be wrong because memory is is weird when you get older. But <clears throat> when I what? visited you in <laughs> Seattle, <laughs> so you had you had stuff. You were building it even back then, so two thousand two thousand one. Um, but did you not have like? handwritten notes from Einstein? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've got Einstein. Uh, he happens to be in the file cabinet right now. Oh, my God. I've got several notes on his uh, letterhead, which was the Association of Atomic Energy Scientists. I mean, just <laughs> great, great stuff. And where he's writing to people asking for uh, their opinions on certain things and actually signed by him. Wow. Incredible. Gosh. Oscar Wilde is one of my favorites in history. Uh, he had such a great wit, such a fine mind. Um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a great hobby. I encourage it to anybody. Uh, and, and, you know, it's, it's, it's that old axiom. If those who ignore the lessons of history are doomed to repeat them. Right. If you, you have to know history in order to learn what not to do. And... Uh, I think our political leaders are missing that point today. Agreed. And, and uh, that's something that builds respect for who you are as a person today is by knowing how other people survived, how they, how you actually got here with, yeah. with or without their help. Someone, someone led the way in every field. And Amazing. What are five things that people need to know? The penmanship. <laughs> oh, yes. I want to have good penmanship. <laughs> an actual pen. They're not at the top schools anymore. Yeah. I know. It's crazy. I um, have like a, 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 such great things for your brain, too. <laughs> I know. I've got my own. <laughs> like, uh, people don't do enough of it. They're just all thumbs these days. <laughs> um, have a sensible survival kit. Uh, that's another thing people need to know. What, what's, what, is, uh, what does that entail? We've got to be prepared for that zombie apocalypse. Fair. Uh, earth, earthquakes uh, and uh, things like that. Um, what's with all the toilet paper hoarding, by the way? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I, you know what I did? I went and got a tushy. What is a tushy? It's like a, it's a, it's a bidet for your toilet. I got one of those two after it. <laughs> oh, never, I was just like, never again am I going to even worry about this. <laughs> I know. People <laughs> underestimate the power of bidets. And <laughs> right. European is common every day in Europe. Yeah. We, we, uh, we fell in love with them when we went to uh, Asia. 
and we're just like they're everywhere. Oh, it's just like this is such yeah. a reasonable thing. So so uh, clever to yeah. deadlines. When you commit to having something done at a certain time, stick to it. Personally, I love deadlines. I love the whooshing sound. They <laughs> bye bye. Yes, of course. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> there's my deadline. <laughs> uh, travel and learn. I think I think uh, it, uh, it's hard to do these days, but soon when we're when we're all filled with we're all jacked up on antiviral serum, yeah. uh, people should travel to distant lands, learn new cultures, maybe take up a new language. L- well, let me jump on that for a second because yeah. you learned Italian for if I memory serves, you learned Italian for like a yeah. year leading up to getting a villa yeah. in Italy for a month. Yeah. God, where did you remember that? <laughs> yeah, I've been studying Italian for 10 years. Still not fluent, but uh, I can hold my own in conversation. Mostly. Wow. Uh, when, I, when people travel, in fact, when I first started traveling a lot, uh, the further I got away from the U.S., the more I discovered how little I actually knew that when you're exposed to different cultures, yeah. it really it opens your eyes. And uh, I think more, more Americans should go to other countries. I couldn't agree more. I was having this exact same conversation with my eldest son yesterday, who's in London with his new wife. And he's traveled all over the world for like the last, you know, five years. And he's just mm-hmm. like, we need to do this as a people. Yeah, I agree. Totally agree. I also, I also think, I believe in national service. I served in the army for three years. I think every American should be required to have two years of some service that, that where it's not all about themselves and giving, they're, they're helping other people or giving back somehow. Oh, I love it. I think that should be, that should be essential. It is in many countries. Yeah. Uh, and they, in many ways are, are uh, ahead of us culturally yeah. because of the, because of that exposure and that's, that's self serve self giving. Uh, and, and be kind to one another, you know, it's, it's, it's as simple as that sounds. Um, we're seeing too much political discord these days. Yeah. We're all on the same spaceship. There's that great philosopher Popeye once said, I can't stand no more. <laughs> <laughs> What's your five or six things? What's your what's your favorite uh non national holiday? <laughs> non national holiday? Yeah. <laughs> My least favorite holiday. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like Halloween. Oh. <laughs> uh, I mean, that's just not a, not a fan. I, I the house goes black on October thirty first. Yeah. All right. Um, well, I don't give holidays much thought. All I don't right. really. I don't really participate. Uh, Christmas, uh, you know, Thanksgiving. Not part of my life. What's your favorite book of all time? Ooh, gosh. Uh, That's a tough one, I know. Yeah, really tough. Well, I wouldn't necessarily go to the classics for my, for my own tastes. Um, I suppose In Cold Blood is right up there. And that really is a fantastic piece of literature. And uh, as much as I picked it apart in my own book, I have great respect for it, for it and for Capote as, as its author. Um, well, and then I have various thriller, thriller, you know, Robert Ludlum is the man who encouraged me to get into writing in the first place, his books on him personally. Yeah. Uh, but, um, What's the most meaningful thing anybody has ever told you? I once had a mentor, Leon Becker, who was the man who introduced me into uh, memorabilia. In the mid-80s, he once told me, he was this 
this great large Jewish man, and uh, I was having struggles with my board of directors at the time in the software, the uh, sailing company. And I was sitting and moping to him and he said, Gary, don't let the little people get you down. When you're rising up, they're going to grab you and pull you back down to earth. Don't let them do that. <laughs> and I've never <laughs> forgotten that. I've, I've never forgot that. And that advice has stuck with me. And uh, I never let anyone bring me down. Now it's all within me to control that. I love it. Are you still boxing? I'm 71, dude. <laughs> I could barely box when I was doing it in my 60s. <laughs> I had a good year, but then I threw my shoulder out. And it was, <laughs> and I was out of commission for doing much of anything for six months. Oh, my God. I just realized that, you know, for me and uh, the uh, shape I was in, that was, that was a pretty good shape period for me, but yeah. not now. Yeah. Not now. Um, <clears throat> Pacific Ocean or Atlantic? Pacific that, that was like, that was a that was a softball I threw. <laughs> uh, not even a choice. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Uh, do you get a chance to watch much uh, Netflix or Crave or Amazon? Uh, and what's your what's your guilty pleasure? Uh, well, no particular channel, but I like I like uh, suspense thrillers. Yeah. I think particularly since I get a lot of my ideas for writing uh, and, and plot structure, dialogue. That's, mm -hmm. what I, that's why I watch every night. Wow. Uh, I spend a full day. I'm usually up sitting here from 9 a.m., you know, 8 a.m. to uh, 6 every day, every single day. I don't have a family, so it doesn't impinge on anyone else's life. Yeah. And uh, watch uh, one or two movies tonight. Hard to filter through the, the garbage out there, but I'll, I'll usually go through five or six, watch the first 15, 20 minutes, decide if it's worth my time. Yeah. Which I can never get back. And <laughs> it's the only thing we've got, really. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. It's all true. Uh -huh. uh, but I'll find some gems from time to time and uh, get out my notepad and. And make notes on what this, uh, what's what's going on, how I can use these types of strategies in my own writing. Oh, that's so awesome. it's both pleasure and uh, work at the same time. Yeah, mix it all up. Yeah, it's not like I get blacked out on alcohol or pot and just lean back and I watch colored movies. <laughs> you know, movies, <laughs> moving colors on my screen. <laughs> That's not the way I roll. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I know. <laughs> no opium addiction? God. No, no. It's great, not. <laughs> um, it's so not that much of a rebel. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it, it was funny. Like, years ago when I was, when I was young, uh, and like, I, like, we're talking young, young, like teenager, and I was, I was lamenting the fact that I wasn't an accomplished smoker. And, you know, like, I, I don't know what that meant, but I was just like, I was, I was telling my friend that, oh, I just wish I was better at this. He goes, well, the only accomplished smoker is a dead smoker. So you're doing okay. You said that when I was smoking and this was, I haven't been smoking for 30 years. Yeah. I was smoking. I, people looked at me and said, are you doing that right? <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't look like, you know, how you smoke. <laughs> Never do understood that, but. <laughs> maybe i wasn't yeah. holding it right or sucking yeah. on it right. i don't know just I, I felt that there should have been more to it yeah yeah <laughs> just all there, there you go um so one of the one of the i mean again we've known each other for a lot of years um and we we dip in and out of each other's orbit every once in a while Mm -hmm. One thing that I've always loved about you is the fact that you just have always marched to your own drummer you've done your own thing and you know, my question to you is, and my favorite part of the show is when I get to ask my guests what advice they would give to the people I call rebels in waiting. These are the, the rebels who are, are like really just, you know, they want to write that first novel or they want to start that first business or they want to travel or they want to learn a new language. Now, here's the thing. You've done all of those things. What advice would you give them to help them out? Persist. 
persistence. Uh, I've wanted to write, as I said, well, since I was 10. I knew yeah. that, that various things were standing in my way and that I had to have patience to do what I really wanted to do, but only after I'd accomplished other things. And uh, financial security has always been important to me. Uh, for most of my life, I've lived hand to mouth, you know, month to month, as so many people do. I mean, I'm, I'm hardly alone in that. Um, uh, fortunately, the, the circumstances are such now that, that I have the time and, and the, uh, um, the situations are different than they were when I was growing up. Right. So, uh, but it took so long to get here. And there were times of frustration when I was saying, what am I doing this for when I really want to write? Yeah, but that, that doesn't do much to motivate you to, to in my case, write. Yeah. Uh, but they were certainly stored experiences for uh, use when I was uh, ready to write. <clears throat> that makes any sense. Yeah, persistence, just to stick it out, get along as much as you can, doing what you have to do. Uh, but, you know, it sounds trite, but live, live your dream. And I had my dream, and now I'm living it. You know, I don't know how much longer I'll live to enjoy it, but I'm certainly in the best place I've ever been in my life right now. Oh, that is so good. Yeah. Wow. What's your... What's your um What's your favorite meal that you prepare? Because I know that you're an accomplished chef. Fettuccine Alfredo. Oh. My favorite of all foods. And uh, hand uh, grated parm? I don't do much cooking. Uh, well, for definitely hand grated parmesan. I don't do much cooking these days. I oh. have one of those uh, uh, meal services like Blue Apron. Oh, wonderful. All freshly. Yeah. <laughs> and so all my meals are delivered and... Uh, uh, it saves me time to where I can keep writing and I don't have to cook. <laughs> That's great, great quality foods, low caloric intake. And, uh, yeah. yeah, life is good. Oh, that's so good. Gary, this has been an absolute pleasure catching uh, up with you. Thank you so much, Michael. Thanks. There you go. First episode of 2021 with many more on deck. Check out the show notes at the rebel rebel podcast.com to get all the links from today's show, including where to get Gary's many books. Not only that, you can get a paid subscription to the show and help us find and share even more amazing stories from around the world. Thanks so much for listening until next time.